Babylon, Ur of the Chaldees, a land of kings and kingdoms, the land of the prophets Abraham and Daniel. The artifacts in this room date as far back as 2300 BC, making them over 4,000 years old. It was here in ancient Babylon that written communication found its beginning. is the term used for this ancient form of writing. The word cuneiform literally means wedge-shaped writing. Cuneiform was not a language. It was a method of writing that enabled scribes to keep records and document events. The scribes molded soft clay into tablets or shapes of various kinds. Then, using a small pencil-like reed called a stylus, they made impressions into the clay. Each combination of these pictograms and phonograms was like a special code, readable by the king, the scribes, and the officials of the land. This system of writing led to the linking of symbols with certain sounds, the beginning of what we know as the alphabet. At this time in history, God had not yet revealed himself to man in written form. Therefore, none of these artifacts contain scripture texts, but the development of writing was a crucial step in God's plan to continue the process of revelation. Revelation is God making himself known to man. When did God first reveal himself in written form? Revelation is a special act of God whereby he reveals to man certain truths that man could not know otherwise. The first record that we have in the Bible of God communicating with man is in Genesis 128, where God commands Adam and Eve to keep the garden, replenish the earth, and so forth. That's the first recorded verbal communication. It is true that when God first began to communicate with man, he usually did it on an individual basis. But when we come to the book of Joshua, we really see a change in the way that God worked. After the death of Moses and Joshua was now the leader of the children of Israel, God told him that he was to consult the law of God, the books of Moses. So God indicated that he is now going to guide his people primarily through a book and not through just speaking to them. And we have that book when we have scripture today. So we have God's direction, God's commandments, God's leading through a book. The scriptures record the story of God's great redemptive acts that culminate in the person and work of Christ. They are a record that is sufficient for salvation, understandable in their basic teaching. God's word is necessary for sinful man to know and authoritative for his beliefs and actions. We have in our collection one of the most amazing pieces of archaeology that have ever been discovered. It's made out of clay, and originally it was about 14 to 16 inches high. It was called a prism. It was made on a potter's wheel, so it was hollow, and then after it was finished, they would cut it on six sides and form a hexagon. Then the scribe would write on it. When he was finished, he put a dome top on it. Now, this particular piece we call the Sennacherib prism because it was done by King Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, after his campaign against the nation of Judah. And on this particular portion of the prism, we find the words recorded that Sennacherib conquered the walled cities of Judah, which was true. He surrounded Jerusalem, true again. He had tribute paid to him, true again. And he even says that he penned up King Hezekiah as one pens up a bird in a cage. However, he doesn't tell us the rest of the story. We have to go to Scripture for that. We're in the book of 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles, and even in the book of Isaiah, we find that the angel of the Lord went into the camp of the Assyrians and slew 185,000 of them. So what is the value of this? Well, there are no scriptural texts, as far as we know, recorded on cuneiform, but these historical pieces show that the Bible is accurate and we can trust in it. We have seen that the scriptures are the written record of the revelation of God to man through history.
Come with me now as we move to another time, to a place where you will see some of the oldest examples of the scriptures themselves. The largest library was built in Alexandria, a city on the Mediterranean, founded by Alexander the Great during his conquest of Egypt. Beginning in the 3rd century BC, the goal of this library was to possess a copy of every known literary text in the world. It is estimated that over 500,000 manuscripts were housed in the library. Many of the texts were written on papyrus, a plant indigenous to Egypt. Others were written on leather, wood, or even pottery. The use of scrolls marked another advancement in the development of written communication. Compared to clay tablets, scrolls were less expensive, more durable, and lightweight, easier to transport. It is likely that the first words of the Bible to be recorded were written on papyrus. But what separates the Bible from other books? Did the words of Scripture originate from the minds of the writers, like Moses or Daniel? Was God directly involved in the choice of words, or merely the thoughts? The process used by God to communicate His message to man through the written word is called inspiration, a word that comes from the Scriptures themselves. the term inspiration quite often loosely it actually comes from the Greek word theopneustos and it literally means God breathed but what's interesting about the word is that it has the connotation of not just breathing but of breathing in and it's not God's breathing into himself but God breathing into the man to whom revelation is being given it is literally God speaking through the Holy Spirit, speaking through a man, to men. It's a very mysterious and miraculous act of God. But it is absolutely essential because without inspiration, the Bible would not have the divine authority over men's lives to be the basis of what they believe and how they live. The Bible claims for itself to be inspired. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That was written at the end of Paul's ministry. 2 Timothy was one of the last things he wrote. And so all of the Old Testament as well as the New Testament was really caught up in Paul's mind when he said all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So that's a statement of the what. Uh, the Bible is inspired. When you come to the how he did it, there's not much information given, but there's a window that's very interesting. It's in 2 Peter 1.21. The prophecy came not, the prophecy referring to Scripture, came not at any time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. It's that word move that gives us the window. And that word is a word that means to carry along. The writers use their own vocabulary. They use their own verbal style. So you can tell from the original languages uh, the writings of Paul and distinguish them from the writings of Peter, for instance. And so you know that God didn't dictate or would all be the same. So God allowed them to use their individual styling. But God influenced them so that what they wrote was what he wanted them to write. We believe in what we call the plenary verbal view of inspiration. The word plenary just simply means totality. We believe that all scripture was inspired by God. We also include in that view of inspiration what we call verbal inspiration. That means the words themselves are inspired. So we believe in what we call the plenary verbal view of inspiration, the totality of the Bible and each word. We have here one of the real treasures of the scriptorium. It is a scroll, it is written in Hebrew, but its origin is Kaifeng, China. At one time, it was the largest city in the world, at the eastern end of the Silk Trade Route. History tells us that Jews went to the city of Kaifeng and built a synagogue about the year 1163. But in 1642, some nearly 400 years later, the city came under attack. 
and the attackers actually broke the dike system that preserved the city from the Yellow River. And the Yellow River actually flooded the city. And in that flood, about 300,000 people died. We have records that tell of two young Jewish men who swam through the floodwaters to the synagogue and rescued seven scrolls. And this is one of the seven scrolls that was rescued from the synagogue at Kaifeng. It is on goat skin. It is the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 1, through chapter 42, verse 7. It bears the marks of water damage. Another interesting feature of the Kaifeng scroll is how the panels of the scroll are joined together. Usually they were joined by loops of animal sinews, but the Kai Feng scroll is joined together by silken thread. If we remember that Kai Feng was located at the eastern end of the silk trade route, we would be aware that silken thread was readily available. And it is a scroll that gives abundant testimony to God having his word halfway around the world in the year 12 or 1300. Over the course of centuries, the Library of Alexandria was completely destroyed by wars and disasters. Nearly all of its treasures were lost forever. But the inspired word of God endured. Here at the Holy Land Experience, there is something for everyone. You can meet one of our biblical archaeologists as they lead you on one of many fascinating journeys throughout the day. Whether it's explaining the garden tomb, where Christ was buried and resurrected, or showing the significance of the temples of Israel, you will be informed and inspired by the modern-day relevance of God's Word. During the Middle Ages, monks and scribes realized the importance of God's Word. Let's now take a look at these people and the important works they accomplished in the monasteries. that nothing of importance took place during the so-called Dark Ages. We think of castles, knights, war, plagues. But during this tumultuous time, God continued to keep watch over his word. Nearly all books were completed in monasteries until the year A.D. 1100. The most frequently copied book was the Bible. Monks copied from a finished book called an exemplar. Breaking only for meals, prayer, and tending the garden, they carefully copied every page by hand onto parchment. One of the manuscripts that came out of this era is still used today in the Roman Catholic Church. It is the Latin Vulgate, commissioned by Pope Damasus. The translation was done by Jerome, one of the finest linguists of the early church, Jerome's Latin Vulgate replaced the Old Latin, which had become corrupt through copying errors. Monasteries and universities across Europe provided islands of calm, where dedicated monks and scribes painstakingly copied the biblical text. In scriptoria like this, scribes spent their lives laboring at the grueling task. These devoted servants of God had answered the Lord's calling to help carry forward His plan of salvation. One of the unfortunate things with regard to the transmission of the Bible is that we do not have any of the original autographs, the original writings of Moses or David or Peter or Paul. And those writings, they deteriorated and they passed off, and we have no idea whatever happened to them. So the big question is, uh, do we have a reliable text? How was the text transmitted so that we can be sure that we have an accurate rendering of the original autographs? Around the year 480, there was a man whose name was St. Benedict, and he developed a rule. It was actually called the Rule of St. Benedict in order to give some structure to the life of the monks. And the rule was built around four activities of the monks. They were to work, work with their hands, doing manual labor. They were to read, read the Word of God. They were to pray, and they were to meditate. Another of the rules 
was his desire to have their libraries increased. We have to remember at this time, if you wanted to have a book, you could not go out and buy it. You would have to find a copy of a book that would be held by someone. They would have to loan it to you, and then you would copy it out by hand. So in each of the monasteries, they had a special room, and that room was called the scriptorium. Literally, that word means writing room. And by the way, it was the one room in a monastery where it was said that there was heat. And the reason for the heat was not for the comfort of the monks, but to prevent their inks from freezing and their hands from becoming numb. So in the scriptoria, the monks would copy out the scriptures. Scribes were artists. They had the ability, much like a calligrapher today, to write uh, in beautiful form and in straight fashion. And so these calligraphers, these scribes, would copy the scriptures. Many times the monks would add what were called colophons, or endings, to the book. Some of those colophons were humorous. For example, one monk wrote, As the sea tossed and weary sailor longs for the sight of land, so this monk longs for the end of this book. He was just tired of writing. But then there were other colophons that showed more a serious side and a spiritual side. For example, we read that one monk wrote these words. This book has been copied out faithfully for you by your friend John. And when my hand that has written these words lies moldering in the grave, the words that I have written will live forever, for they are spirit and they are true. May the reader be blessed to the salvation of the soul by reading the words of life. Copying the scriptures by hand began long before the time of the monasteries. The scribal tradition began in Old Testament times by the people of God within the nation of Israel. The scribal tradition of the Old Testament basically began with Ezra. They went to great lengths to make sure that those copies were accurate. They would, after copying a page or a portion of a scroll, would count the number of words to make sure that what was in the new manuscript was exactly the same as the old. They would count the number of words in a line and make sure that they were exactly the same. They would take the old manuscript, start on each end, and come toward the middle to find the middle letter. Then they go to what they had just copied, start on each end, make sure that that middle letter was the same as the old manuscript. Here before me, I have an example of a book that illustrates how God kept his word. It is a copy of the epistles of Paul. There are two things about it that I find extremely interesting. First is the tradition from which it came. That tradition is called the insular tradition. Insular simply means island. What island? The island of Ireland. And during the time in the history of Europe, when there was warfare, plundering, all types of destruction taking place in or on the mainland of Europe, there were Irish monks who were faithfully copying out the scriptures. So God used the Irish monks to preserve his word. Another thing about this book that is interesting is that it is called a glossed epistle. Now, gloss simply means commentary. And it was a commentary that was taken from the early church fathers, people such as Augustine, Jerome, Athanasius, Tertullian, and others. Their sayings, their interpretations of scripture were collected and then they were put into what is called the gloss. Now, the gloss had a name, the glossa ordinaria. Now, in this case, we're not talking about an ordinary gloss or run-of-the-mill gloss, but the prescribed gloss. This was the prescribed interpretation of Scripture. And it was put together in the Middle Ages by three men. One of those men's name was Anselm of Leon, and his brother, Ralph, and a third man who was called Gilbert the Universal. He was called Gilbert the Universal because he was reported to have known everything about everything. And so this gloss then was put into the uh, written here in, on the pages of the epistle and between the lines of the text. And from that we get in English a phrase that says we must learn to read between the lines because in order to understand the meaning we have to read the gloss that is put between the lines of text. And this would be the way that the Word of God was interpreted in the Middle Ages.
And so this manuscript then shows how God did preserve his work. He preserved it from destruction, and he preserved it from uh, being lost as far as the text was concerned. While it is apparent that God did protect his word, it is also true that many unbiblical teachings and practices crept into the church during the Dark Ages. Across Europe, a number of reforming movements arose as the church was accused of deviation from both the doctrinal and the moral purity of the scriptures. Meanwhile, the Black Death had invaded Europe and more than 30% of the population had died. At times like this, people turn instinctively to their spiritual guides. Unfortunately, the church was not equal to the task. People were thirsty for the truth and comfort. Those who saw a need for doctrinal reformation of the church also desired to give the people the word of God in their own language. An ordained priest of the English church named John Wycliffe was convinced that a genuine spiritual reformation required a knowledge of God's word. Individuals needed to be able to read the Bible for themselves. So, from his parish here in Lutterworth, Wycliffe began the translation of the Latin Vulgate into English. By 1382, both the Old and New Testaments had been translated. When we're speaking about Bible, we're basically talking about the ancient languages of Hebrew and Greek and some Aramaic. Aramaic was a form of Hebrew that developed in the Babylonian captivity, so it was a kind of combination of Hebrew along with some Mesopotamian inflections in the words uh, that became somewhat the common language uh, of the Jewish people during the time of Jesus. So translation of the Bible is translating from the Hebrew, the Greek, the Aramaic into modern languages such as English. The difficulty in translation is that no one language is equal to another language. There are always differences, and struggling to bridge the gap between those differences is always the work of the translator. John Wycliffe is known as the Morning Star of the Reformation. In other words, he was the first one that began to talk about a reform of the church. He first came to prominence in the nation of England where he was born, and he was also a professor of theology and philosophy at Oxford University when he began to put forth a teaching that was called the dominion of grace. Now, dominion of grace meant stewardship over what God had put into your hands. Also, Wycliffe taught that you're not necessarily a Christian just because you become a member of the church. You had to have faith. Well, all of this led to Wycliffe being expelled from his position of professor of theology and philosophy at Oxford. But what appeared to be a tragedy, God overruled for good because Wycliffe then went to Lutterworth, where he became the vicar of the church and where he began to translate the scripture. Whenever you had translations, they were for the purpose of reaching people. And the church would often take exception to the fact that that translation had been made because they began to lose some of their authority, some of their control over the people because the people could now read it in their own language. So it was appreciated by the people, but it was not appreciated by the ecclesiastical system. Because when the people have the Bible in their own hands and they can read it, then they can make a judgment on their own. Is this what God said or is it not? And they can pass judgment on the church and its ways and its thoughts. So the Bible in English was considered illegal from about 1408, 1409 to 1530. We are privileged to have here a Wycliffe Gospels. It is said that there are about 240 Wycliffe manuscripts in the world today. And the scriptorium is privileged to hold six of those. And this is an example of one of the six. It is the Wycliffe Gospels. It has been translated from Latin because we have no 
assurance that Wycliffe even knew Greek and Hebrew, and the Greek and the Hebrew text were not available. It's important to remember that it is done in manuscript, because John Wycliffe lived before the time of printing by movable type. It is written by hand. In fact, we can even see the lines on the pages that would enable the scribe to write it clearly and accurately. It's written in an English that's called Middle English. That was the English of Chaucer, of Pierce Plowman. It is not an English that we would understand today. There were two really Wycliffe manuscripts or Bibles. There is what is called Wycliffe A. That was more of a literal translation from the Latin. And if you would read that, it would almost follow the Latin context and the Latin syntax, and it would read more like Latin than it did English. But there was another translation that was done by his friend John Purvey that is called Wycliffe B. Wycliffe B is more what we would call a looser translation. It doesn't follow the syntax of the Latin. It seeks to put the Word of God into readable English. This Wycliffe Gospels is a Wycliffe B. In other words, this is the one that we feel was translated by John Purvey. Now, what would happen to Gospels like this or manuscripts? Wycliffe and his helpers would give them to these poor priests or the Lollards. They would take them, they would go to a town, and an announcement would be made, tonight we're going to hear the Word of God. And the people would gather together, and they would sit literally in the darkness to hear the poor priest read the Word of God. And then after he finished, he would pack up his books, he would leave, go off to another town, and then about six weeks later, the announcement would be made, someone else is coming to read us the Bible. Perhaps the first reader read from the book of Mark. Well, this man is going to read from the book of Romans. And by that way, even though people didn't have copies of the Scripture, because they're all handwritten, they're very expensive, and even indeed many of the people couldn't read, the knowledge of the Word of God began to circulate and disseminate through the entire land of England, preparing for the Reformation of the 16th century. So it's just an amazing book that shows how God, despite the opposition and indifference of the church, was able to make the knowledge of his word known in England. Through the translation of the Latin Bible into English, the people's hunger for the word of God was sustained and deepened. Wycliffe's English Bible was a critical step toward the reformation of the church. God would soon raise up more believers to carry out the next part of his providential plan for the dispersion of the gospel. interrupt the musical presentation in our Chopin Auditorium. The Holy Land Experience presents a world thriving with musical dramas, uplifting presentations and featured exhibits unlike anything you've ever seen before. Here we are in Mainz, Germany, in the year 1455. Johannes Gutenberg had spent the last 10 years refining an invention that significantly advanced the Reformation movement. Gutenberg's invention of printing by movable type has been called a hinge of history, an event on which the course of history pivots. Operated by just two men, Gutenberg's printing press could do in a day what it took a room full of scribes months to accomplish. The key to Gutenberg's process was a calibrated type mold that allowed individual letters to be quickly produced. Gutenberg's experience as a metalsmith served him well. 
in developing a unique alloy that was suitable to withstand the rigors of repeated impressions. The type was hand-set, letter by letter, into a wood frame. Then ink was rolled over the raised surface of the type, and the frame was pressed against a sheet of paper. Gutenberg was reputed to be a devout believer, so it is no accident that the first book to be selected for printing was the Bible. When we talk about the Reformation that actually took place in the 16th century, we still have to go back in time to a period that saw the rise of what were called the forerunners of the Reformation. John Wycliffe was a forerunner. John Huss of Bohemia was a forerunner. Peter Valdo of the Baldasian. Now, the forerunners were people who, as it were, were ahead of their time. They were able to see down through the centuries and see the church really needed a reformation. It needed to be changed. It's not that they wanted to change the church into something totally different. It is not even that they wanted to bring the church under the beliefs of the reformers themselves, except for one belief. That one belief was that the church, as well as the people, placed themselves under the authority of the Word of God. Sola Scriptura, the Scriptures alone. We may not realize it when we look at this book that we actually have left one world and come into another. We've left the medieval world and we're now in the modern world. This is a Gutenberg Bible. It is a Latin Vulgate and it is reported to be the first book printed by movable type. The Gutenberg Bible was a 42-line Bible that was printed in the year 1455 at the print shop of Johannes Gutenberg in Mainz, Germany. It is almost impossible to describe the impact that printing by movable type had on the world. For one thing, it meant that books could be produced quicker, more accurately, and less expensively than being copied out by hand. Before this time, every book was a manuscript. It was written by hand. Now it can be duplicated very quickly. So this book, even though it is a Latin Vulgate, even though it is in a language that most people don't understand, is going to provide a means into the Reformation time. One of the most significant advances toward the Reformation was the recovery of the Greek language. For centuries, copies of the Greek scriptures had been tucked away and forgotten. Now the time had come for them to resurface. And this is where a man named Erasmus enters the picture. Erasmus was a great humanist. He had learned the Greek language. In fact, some say he was the greatest Greek scholar in all of Europe. And Erasmus wanted to see the Word of God in Greek as well. But Erasmus also had another desire. Erasmus was dissatisfied with the Vulgate, so he did a translation into Latin. So he had a Latin translation and a Greek translation that he wanted to see printed together. He approached a Greek printer, actually living in Basel, his name was Johannes Froben, and Froben and Erasmus cooperated together to produce the first printed and published Greek New Testament. It was called the Novum Instrumentum the new instrument. It is the instrument that it's going to be used to carry out a reform of the church. It is a book that contains the Greek on the left-hand column and the Latin, which is not the Vulgate. It is La uh, the translation that Erasmus himself did, and those two run parallel. In the scriptorium, we are privileged to have many rare and precious books. But I would submit to you that this may be the most important book that is contained in the scriptorium. I say that because this is the book that gave us the Reformation. And it gave us the Reformation because now the students of scripture would not consult a translation for their teaching. Before this time, they had to study the Latin Vulgate. Now they can go back to the original sources themselves. And as People like Martin Luther went back and studied the text in its original language. 
he discovered that certain errors had crept into the Vulgate, mistranslations. One of those translations dealt with the word repent. In the Latin Vulgate, it was translated as do penance, which was a sacrament of the church. But an even more important mistranslation, or more critical, was the translation of the word to justify. Jerome, when he translated the word, made it sound like a moral change. He translated to justify as to make righteous. That is a change that takes place within the person himself. But when the word to justify is used in the Greek New Testament, it is always, always used in a legal sense, to declare righteous. It is something that God himself pronounces upon the person. And Martin Luther himself said these words, When I saw that the righteousness of Christ, or the righteousness of God, was not an impossible standard to which I had to attain by my own efforts, but saw that it was God's free gift in Christ, and it was received by faith alone, I felt I had entered the gates of paradise. Well, from where did Martin Luther see that? From this very book, right here in the 17th verse of the first chapter of the Book of Romans. As we have seen, Johannes Gutenberg's invention played a critical role in the Reformation. Martin Luther's printed German Bible and his 95 Theses initiated what was to be one of history's great religious movements. Luther became a beacon for other great reformers throughout Europe. We are standing in a model of Jerusalem as it appeared during the year 66 AD. It is the world's largest indoor model of ancient Jerusalem. Through our presentation, you are able to see a recreation of the city's landmarks and learn about Christ's final days in Jerusalem. Designer Tom Allen, together with a combination of staff and volunteers, took 12 months to build this model. There are over 1,000 buildings and over 10,000 characters. Each character was individually hand-painted and cast in pewter. Four tons of plaster were used to create the houses and the terrain area. The Temple Plaza took three months to build. Solomon's porch has 3,000 individual parts. This temple is a magnificent replica of the same one that stood during the time of Christ, also known as Herod's Temple. This is just one of the many sights to see at the Holy Land experience. It was with great conviction that the apostles began to proclaim in Jerusalem the truth of the gospel message. Let's now take a look at some others who shared that same conviction. It is one thing to have the scriptures and to be able to interpret them correctly. To apply them to one's life is quite another. The Bible is a very practical book that helps us form a godly character. One of the greatest character traits is that of conviction or the persuasion that because something is true, we can build our lives upon it. During the second half of the 17th century, Pastor John Bunyan spent 12 years of his life here, in England's Bedford Jail, not far from the place where he was born. Bunyan had answered the call of God to be a preacher, despite the fact that it was against the authority of the state church. John Bunyan was willing to be in prison for preaching the word of God because he was convicted of its truth. While in prison, John Bunyan took strength in God and found the inspiration to write more than 60 books, including The Pilgrim's Progress. This great spiritual allegory has stirred the hearts of millions and has been printed more times in the English language than any other book except the Bible. John Bunyan really was an innovator with regard to writing and the literature that he produced. 
the novel was just beginning to be known in England, where there was a storyline, where there were characters, and so we take that for granted today, but it was very innovative back then. And so putting his writing, the story of how to become a Christian and how to engage in spiritual conflict into story form was uh, an innovation in and of itself. A second thing he did was allegory. That is, use metaphorical language to represent reality. And that caught people's imagination, and they loved the allegorical approach. I believe that Bunyan was a special writer because he had a unique ability to communicate with people. In fact, the story is told of John Bunyan by a man whose name was John Owen. And John Owen is considered the greatest theologian that England has ever produced. And one day, there was a conversation between John Owen and another man, and John Owen said these words, I have learned more from the tinker, meaning John Bunyan, than any other theologian because of his ability to communicate. When Bunyan got up in the pulpit, he spoke out of a, a life that really did grapple with the truth. God worked in his heart in such a way that his sin was so sensitive to him that when he spoke, the sensitivity to sin really was experienced by all of the people. Bunyan's great crime was that the Church of England wanted him to sign a license, in effect, saying that he was authorized by the church to proclaim and preach the word of God. But Bunyan was convicted that the calling to preach is of God and that the power to license is the power to control. And that if he had signed the license, it was in effect giving the church control over the preaching of the word of God. Literally, we come back to it again as we did with Luther, sola scriptura. With Bunyan, it was the scriptures alone are the authority, and he could place no authority above them. And for that, John Bunyan spent over 12 years in Bedford Prison. And so John Bunyan, with a family of four young children and a wife, was willing to endure 12 years of imprisonment for conscience sake. That expresses his conviction. He began to write The Pilgrim's Progress when he was in jail. And uh, the book we have in our collection is a third edition. The first edition was done in 1678. And just a year later, there was a third edition. The Pilgrim's Progress is a book in the English language that has been printed more than any other book in the history of the English language other than the Bible. And it has come down to our own day even as a very popular rendition. And so even today, as we come into the 21st century, the Pilgrim's Progress is still a very revered work. John Bunyan's books are classics, the products of a fertile mind overflowing with imagery, imagery that stemmed from a convicted and contrite heart. They are also the sober reflections of a good soldier of Jesus Christ who endured hardships for the sake of the gospel. As the Reformation struggled to get a foothold in England and Europe, there were those who sought their spiritual destinies elsewhere. Yearning for religious liberty, 102 brave pilgrims boarded the tiny ship Mayflower and journeyed across the Atlantic Ocean. Toward the end of 1620, after more than two months at sea, they came ashore on the rugged coast of Massachusetts. Here, these pilgrims established the Plymouth Bay Colony and planted the seeds of their faith in Christ. The goal of seeking religious freedom can never be separated from the basis of the authority on which that freedom is to be built. For the pilgrims who settled at Plymouth, that basis of authority was the Bible. They were not ashamed to profess their faith in God's word, and they sought to build their society on its teachings. The pilgrims were much like the reformers in as much as 
like the reformers, they wanted the church to place itself under the authority of the scriptures. Where they differ from those early reformers is that they recognized the fact that was not going to happen. That the church was not going to place itself under the authority of the scriptures. And the only way they were going to have a society in which the church was under the authority of the scriptures was to start a new society. And so they left. They separated themselves. In fact, in some writings, they're called separatists rather than pilgrims. They actually devised something which was called the Mayflower Compact, and that also was based on the Word of God. In fact, the Mayflower Compact would become, in many ways, something of a foundation stone in the Constitution that would later be written for this nation. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, the Apostle Paul says, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may become perfect, thoroughly furnished in every good work. A and that's basically saying that in every process of life, whether it's learning, whether it's correcting bad behavior, whether it's getting on the right track, or whether it's learning by discipline the new behaviors of life, it's the authoritative word that really performs the molding process of a man or a woman of God. The Bible of the Pilgrims was the Geneva Bible, and it was an amazing work. After King Henry VIII's death in 1547, his son, Edward VI, only reigned for six years, dying in 1553. His place was taken by his half-sister Mary, otherwise known as Mary Tudor or Bloody Mary. And Mary instituted a series of, really, persecutions against the Protestants, Many of them left and went to the city of Geneva in Switzerland. The group that went to Geneva were an amazing group. They had good Greek scholars such as William Whittingham, Hebrew scholars such as Anthony Gilby, and they decided they were going to update William Tyndale's work and produce a new translation of the Word of God. Now, when I say a new translation, we should keep in mind they didn't start just from the beginning but they did examine every part of the scripture according to the Greek text. And the Greek text had become more accurate because there were further editions of the Greek New Testament that were printed. So they were able to use the very latest insights of biblical scholarship to do their translation. So as they were gathered in Geneva during the years, we'll say 1553 to 1558, they worked on this Bible. The Bible itself, is just an amazing book. For one thing, there are certain features about it that were new. First of all was the size. This is what we call the quarto size. This is, should be distinguished from what they call the folio, the great Bibles, large Bibles. This was more portable. You could carry this around. Second thing was the type. Rather than using what we call black letter or the Gothic type, they used Roman type much easier to read. Also, this was the first English Bible that had versification. Verses were added so that the person could find a passage of Scripture without much difficulty. Another thing about this Bible is that it is probably the first English study Bible. It was intended to be studied. And in order to do that, to make that easier for the person, they added marginal notes. And these marginal notes were there in order to help the person understand what the passage said. But unfortunately, those marginal notes got them in a bit of trouble. It was not accepted by Queen Elizabeth because certain of those notes actually cut against her idea of divine rule. And what Elizabeth did was have another translation done that was completed in 1568. It was called the Bishop's Bible. It was done by six of her bishops and their helpers. And so we had two Bibles. We had the Geneva Bible, the Bible for the people, and we had the Bishop's Bible, the Bible of the church. In the outcome, the Geneva Bible went through some 80 editions, while the Bishop's Bible struggled to reach 18 or 19. This really did become the Bible of the people the pilgrims, the Puritans, and it undoubtedly was the first Bible brought to the New World. In the pages of the Geneva Bible, the pilgrims found the spiritual strength they needed.
During that first difficult year in the New World, they founded a colony on the authority of the Bible and the ideal of religious freedom. The Bible is more than a religious artifact that survived the ravages of time. It is the revealed and inspired Word of God. It is God's message of salvation to mankind. That Christ Jesus died for our sins so that we, through faith in Him, might have eternal life. In reading this great book, we hear from individuals whose unwavering devotion to God and His will inspired countless generations through the ages. Moses, Isaiah, King David, Mary, the mother of Jesus, Paul, John. Through individuals like these, God advanced his loving plan for mankind's redemption. A plan that has, at its foundation, the laws handed down to us by God himself. Man has never been able to keep the commandments of God and is therefore under his judgment. But Jesus Christ, the Son of God, became the Savior of mankind by his perfect life and sacrificial death for our sins. All who place their faith in him receive the gift of eternal life. This is the only hope of mankind. This is the message of the Bible. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The time we've spent together has shown us the marvelous story of God's powerful preserving hand upon the course of history. We have seen how God worked through the lives of men and women who often with tremendous sacrifice were instrumental in delivering the scriptures to the world. In whatever form or language it may be presented, the Bible continues to endure, now and for all time. In the words of the Apostle Peter, the grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever.